lofts her anthropomorphically enacts male desire towards the white woman's body in conjunction with the human male in the image. Just as important is that the woman sitting on the man's shoulder is probably also Scottish, as her tartan-like headscarf matches the sash worn by the lobster man around his waist. Art historian Elizabeth Johns has argued that in the 19th century, American genre painting used the tam shanter to associate its figures with abolitionism, thus positing provocative questions regarding the ways that 19th century visual tropes were still provocative types in racial constructions and social relationships as late as this postcard's publication in 1909. And I posted this on a um, website for people who collect postcards to discuss that people post images of postcards that they're interested in getting other people's feedback on because I was curious about the lobster and they had a whole lobster postcard thread. And uh, someone pointed out that during this time, women would also be referred to as lobsters because the meat was all in the tail. And, <laughs> and so I'm not sure if that, that has anything to do, do with this particular card, but I, after someone mentioned that to me, I, I realized that they're both like red and they both have the same kind of sinuous curvature and her butt's clearly sticking out. So maybe that, that's the other reference that I didn't initially pick up on. Anyhow, I'll leave that up to you to decide. <laughs> While the image in and of itself speaks volumes about the ways that the lower classes were positioned in the period's visual culture, the writing on the back is even more telling, and I don't have a picture of this, but I have to take my word for it. The recipient of this card was an attorney, Mr. Frank Brown Esquire. The sender of this card, who was a woman, was not just commenting upon her perceptions of the working class when she chose this image. She was also asking a middle or upper class recipient to mediate on the very nature of the working class. The caption on this postcard likewise literally asks for an imagined identification between the male elite recipient with the physically sexually open, working class, and racialized male depicted. Sorry, excuse me. Like the postcard itself, postcard image types did not spring forth in a, from a vacuum. They were firmly grounded in the greeting card and comic Valentine images that preceded them. In Barry Shank's book, A Token of My Affection, which I quote from liberally today, Shank outlines the comic Valentine's history. Called Penny Dreadfuls or Vinegar Valentines, these cards became popular during the mid-19th century and persisted in popularity throughout the rest of the century. In stark contrast to the sentimental or affectionate greeting card images and captions that marked many of the Valentine's Day cards of the time, these cards purposefully made fun of almost every kind of person imaginable. Most often, working class people and women who did not fit the idealized version of middle to upper class white womanhood were the objects of derision. Penny dreadfuls received their names because they were literally dreadful greetings, poorly printed on cheap paper that cost one penny to purchase. In addition to the dread that one might feel when receiving a card of this sort, which were usually mailed anonymously, insult was added to injury since during the 19th century, the recipient of a card or letter was responsible for paying the postage. <laughs> yes. In other words, not only would a card receiver find an anonymous and cruel card in his or her mail, they were also then required to actually pay for the insult. <laughs> of these cards and images, Shank, uh, Shank argues that they, quote, policed the middle class and took strategic advantage of the potential for anonym anonymity that printed communication in the post system offered. They were equally concerned with the formation of the policing of desire, both carnal and material, with a new, confusing, and apparently endless opportunities for longing, end quote. And this is where the, the next couple images are pretty racist, I'm just fair warning. Policing carnal desire through postal material was clearly a motivating force behind this penny dreadful circa 1890. Here we are presented with a white man who is not particular and is lambasted for being so undiscerning in his taste for women that he's even attracted to African-American wenches, in this case, a mammy figure. And I want to point out also, I keep interrupting myself, but she's clearly taken aback, and I find it really interesting that she's got her fists at, at her side, because to me that signifies that she's resisting this, this advance that he's casting onto her, unwelcomed. Um, yeah. Similar themes are demonstrated on this postcard from the early 20th century. An interactive card wherein postcard users are given a specific African-American Jezebel with whom they can play, inviting the sender to brighten the lips, kiss the lady, and then impress the lips here 
Before sending out the card with the message, a kiss from your own sweet girl, the postcard relies on the apparently comical situation resulting from a presumably white woman or man kissing the face of a black woman. The act of filling in lips with lipstick, which the sender of the card clearly did in this instance, offers the sender the means to literally and figuratively enliven the postcard with color. The joke, of course, achieves its purpose when the receiver finds a card in his or her mailbox. The cruel humor in this postcard situates African-American women as simultaneously sexually promiscuous and pathetic. But the postcard is curious in that it requires a same-sex erotic act in order to fulfill its cultural function. By reproducing and transposing the sender's lips underneath the woman's exaggerated lips, which you can barely see here, it's totally washed out in the image I have on my computer, you can see that someone actually used this card the way it was supposed to be used. Uh, the image conflates white and black female sexuality, suggesting that female sexuality in general is dangerous. The joke undeni undeniably hinges, however, on black women's perceived hypersexuality, though mediated here by a white woman's actions. And there's a companion card as well that I don't have an image of. There's also a, a black man, and you also would fill in his lips with lipstick. Anyhow. Go ahead. The images that appeared on Penny Dreadfuls and Vinegar Valentines in their greeting card form were among the first and most enduring images that appeared on early postcards. But, make sure everybody can see. <laughs> what we still see on the postcard versions are jokes at the expense of individuals who do not fit the status quo. Women who are too fat, old maids who think men are absurd, men whose habits or manners are suspect. For over, for over 60 years then, these images and their accompanying verses circulated throughout United States culture, predominantly through Valentine's, a remarkably durable visual form of mass media, media even by 19th century standards. Undoubtedly, they played a large part in constructing how 19th and early 20th century users viewed each other, how they viewed themselves, and how they communicated their prejudices openly and publicly through transmitting these images. But before we cast suspicious eyes upon these historical images, we have to ask ourselves, how many comic postcards and greeting cards we come across now still fulfill similar social functions? So why then are so many of the historic greeting cards and postcards we see, to get, see today such sanitized versions of the immensely racist, sexist, and classist images that proliferated in the past? For one, many contemporary collectors of these cards are loath to exhibit obviously racist cards. Such things and harrowing themes, it seems, are better left in the box, in the closet, or in the attic of bygone times. In an era when racism is obviously frowned upon and yet remains such a vital factor in cultural and social relations, it's easier for many Americans to look at postcards and greeting cards of white women that showcase sexism and misogyny and laugh at how backward we used to be. Out come the examples and collections of easy-to-digest di artifacts because they do not require us to question how relevant these images are to our current social and cultural relationships. Racist images on greetings and greeting cards and postcards have not been benefited from this liberation. Our failure to acknowledge the racism of the past, to look closely at how these stereotypes informed the relationships of our ancestors and continue to inform the relationships we form today, is just one example of how history is silenced. In the case of racial, ethnic, and class stereotypes on postcards, this sanitization is likewise evidence of how invested the broader Anglo public dialogue is in disavowing that past, and how anxious it still makes us, white or black or Latino or Asian, to discuss these images. I do not mean here in any way to suggest that the Freeport Historical Society has sanitized its collection, <laughs> or that the owner of this card was, you know, is a racist, because I, I own several of these. What I'm suggesting is that there is a broad impulse across white collecting culture, at least, to only collect or exhibit images that we can easily disown, rather than bring forth images that make us uncomfortable. It is much easier to look at an image of a sweet blonde child watering flowers and passively expressing her innocent love than it is to look at racist images of sexual eroticism that require our actual participation for them to work. A fatty degeneration of the brain, indeed. <laughs> Instead, what we often encounter in public exhibitions of mass media from the late 19th and early 20th century are visual figures that fit more comfortably within our chronology of how things were. This is not to say, however, that these themes were not depicted on the mass-produced images of the past. Just as you'd be hard-pressed to open a mass-circulated magazine at your local grocery store today and find an appropriate representation of the diversity of the United States, many turn-of-the-century postcards depicted an unfailing white 
unfailingly white citizenry. In their depiction of white idealized womanhood, then, most of the women on historic Valentine postcards reflect this bias. These women often fitting